Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Elam Road podcast, where today we have a very special guest joining us for a bonus episode over the international break. Delighted to be joined by Elam Road contributor and the king of capturing Brentford on film these days, Tias Coma. Tias, all good, mate? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, this is the first time since I did that game. Uh, it was the last time we won as well. Uh, just disclaimer for anyone who did see me, I wasn't like just randomly taking <laughs> photos of people. It yeah. was like for the club, but a yeah. lot of people were kind of going... Like, you do that sometimes you do that yeah because because i wanted to get <laughs> nice candid way. fan shots they were class yeah. they were but really good then it's just when the, you're in the toilets doing it everyone's a bit yeah like, it's, a, <laughs> it's, it's, it's when the flash goes off because the flash like literally brights brights up the whole place yeah and people would see that go off and go oh, excuse me mate like, what are you doing now? Like, just, shit, sorry uh, yeah, the photos no. are great the photos are really good yeah it was good we'll turned see. out well um and you you've done it like a couple of times i know yeah, last one I did was West Ham, but we lost 4-2. So yeah, I don't think we, that, yeah. that wasn't a great time for photos. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, we'll see in the future. Yeah, um, and you may have already heard from him, but we've got a very special guest. So yeah, warm welcome to our guest for today's episode. Actor, writer, creator of BAFTA winning mockumentary sitcom, People Just Do Nothing. And of course, Brentford fan, Steve Stamp or, or DJ Steves otherwise known as Steve thanks so much for coming on mate really yeah, appreciate thanks for having you. me yeah nice to no, meet I'm, you. I'm looking forward to this it's gonna be good just before we get going guys um remember to drop a comment down below subscribe to the YouTube and Spotify channels and also give us a follow on our socials that's at the Elam Road on Twitter and at Elam Road pod on Instagram um just before we get going Steve so when when, when I've told people that we're having you on as a guest I've had two reactions what one from people that have never seen the show but yeah. the people that have seen the show are like fuck that's so sick it's like a I feel like, and I've heard you speak about it on podcasts before, people that watch the show, it's a bit like a cult following. People yeah. who've watched it absolutely love it, but yeah. some people haven't seen it. So in light of that, I thought before we get going, it might be useful to kind of outline what the show is about for people that haven't seen it. So if you could, your best place to do it, considering yeah. you're the one that wrote it, if you give like a short kind of synopsis of it. Uh, so it's about <laughs> a pirate radio station set in Brentford in, on the Green Dragon Estate. Uh, and it's about... The guys that run the station and their delusions and their also their families and their other stuff that they got going on in their lives uh but it was kind of a it's set in like it's shot in a documentary sort of way so it's like uh pretends to be sort of grounded in reality but it's also ridiculous <laughs> um and yeah it's it's sort of our little love letter to brentford as well in a way because we well, a lot of us grew up in Brentford. Uh, Asim, who plays your buddy, grew up in Hounslow. So, like, that area was very much, like, where we were all born and raised. And we wanted to set the show there because it felt like the perfect place to have these kind of guys that kind of don't aren't quite in the sort of, like, the cool part of London, but they <laughs> <laughs> they're kind of in the... You know what I mean? Brentford's got that kind of, like... Uh, that bus stop in Hounslow sort of reputation. It's like yeah. no one really, no one really knows what Brentford is. <laughs> so I'd, I'd, I'd imagine for like people who watched it not from England, like say American audience, they they'd see that as London and be like, "What? That's not what I think of when I think of London." <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that's real. That is what London is. Like, yeah. London is not Big Ben and like <laughs> Central London. L London is mainly places like. Brentford that mm. are a bus stop where everyone lives <laughs> so uh yeah that's what the show is in a nutshell and uh and obviously we me and my mates basically started filming it uh just for sort of ourselves waistband tv yeah doing youtube <laughs> videos basically uh to try and just demonstrate that we had some talent <laughs> <laughs> beyond just doing office work and signing on uh and then yeah it sort of did all right. It got like a uh, BBC series, ended up doing five series and then doing a film, which is all on Netflix if you want to find out what the <laughs> hell I'm talking about. And uh, yeah, man, it's it's been a good journey. Yeah, so. I can imagine. I've got a few questions about these kind of milestones you had in terms of getting the pilot out and then it being commissioned for another series and the BAFTA as well. But yeah. I thought we'd, we'd start with the Brentford stuff and we've got a ton of questions on Brentford on on the show and kind of weave in between both. Um, so I thought we'd start first with a where were you when. Um, I've got three pretty big moments in terms of being a Brentford fan, <coughs> at least yeah. for us. Um, where were you when Trotter missed the penalty in League One against Doncaster? When, when was that? What year that was, was, that was 12, 13, 13, yeah. 12, 13. Penalty in the last minute off the bar and then Doncaster go and score at the other, at the other end, which prevented us from, from going up. 
Yeah. I can't even remember where I was. <laughs> <laughs> Drowning like, in the sorrows. <laughs> yeah. Those kind of moments, though, those are the ones that you wipe. Like, yeah. You go, yeah. you go extra hard on the drink after those ones. Uh, had, had the show become like an idea at that point? Or like the web series of that? Yeah, it would have been... It would have been the sort of YouTube day. Yeah. yeah. So I guess I probably just would have been like, I wasn't there. I couldn't, I remember that. <laughs> I guess I would have been watching it somewhere. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It was a, it's definitely one I've definitely tried to wipe from my memory, but probably the most pain I've experienced at a Brentford match. I think that I was only a kid when I was there. And I think that was the only time I've cried at football, um, yeah. which was, which was quite painful at the time. I remember <laughs> crying when I was, I feel like it was when we were in, like super low like the maybe when we were about to be promoted into division one like those kind of times mm. and i remember i remember really young crying and i was listening to it on the radio that makes me sound like i'm 90 <laughs> years old but that was like on the radio here in the penalty shootout and that's yeah we lost and i was like in tears at that and yeah. i remember thinking bro i'm like crying at <laughs> yeah i was even aware of it like as a as a young kid like this is wild what about uh promotion to the prem that was quite promotion, a recent one yeah i remember where i was for that i was in a pub i'd, I'd put 200 pound on brentford going up <laughs> because i knew we were, like we were flying at that point it felt like so yeah. if I, I was so sure of it and i was so like uh obviously we'd had the season before where it, like, it no nearly happened and then it just been snatched away and mm. I was like no there's no way it's going to be that this time that's that's a really funny opposite I don't know if I told this story on the podcast but our friend Tom um he was at the game and complete opposite to that he we went 2-0 up at half time yeah and he put 100 quid on Swansea to get promoted yeah <laughs> because he was like it's off the we, we're just gonna lose <laughs> and in his mind he was paying 100 quid and either He's going to get so much money. So when we eventually, you know, bottle it again, yeah, he's going to be fine. Well, it, it'll soften the blow, like you said. Or he's paid 100 quid for us to go up because he's yeah. jinxed it by putting 100 quid on us losing. I don't get that. My brother does that. <laughs> My older brother, shout out Nick, he listens to this podcast. He does he? Yeah, he's, <laughs> Love he's that. one of the people who was like, yeah, you should do it. <laughs> he... Uh, he puts money on us losing like all the time. I think that every week. It's it's a good it's a good strategy. I, I but it it is annoying when you bet against Brentford and it doesn't turn out. It's like I I, I did I did it had an Acheron for when we played uh, Chelsea away. I put Brent, uh, Brentford to lose, Chelsea to win, and I don't know what's better. It's definitely better watching seeing Brentford win than yeah. winning money. But it yeah. is annoying when. You, every other leg comes through and you bet on Brentford to lose and they actually win. <laughs> I, I, I mean, he's I, minted yeah. this season, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair to him. Yeah. He's been a good earner this season. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I do believe in jinxes, though. So whenever... I'll only ever bet on us to win when yeah. I in an Acre or something. But that's always the game we never win. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah, 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 I'd rather cool. just leave us out of it, you know. So would I be right in saying that you grew up on that estate, the, the Green Dragon no, estate? No, not, not on that estate. The one I wanted to say on is Clay Ponds estate if right. you know that one which one's that one sort of like near south ealing road mm, and right. uh, that's where i was like i didn't grow up there but that's where i spent a lot of time as a kid sort of like running about and playing football and all the things that the kids used to do before iphones <laughs> like, <laughs> so that was where in my mind it was going to be set but then the green dragon estates just got the more iconic yeah, towers yeah. and it just actually looked sort of better yeah so no for sure i, I think that that estate is kind of synonymous with Brentford. Whenever there's like a promotional video you see yeah. on TV of, yeah. of Brentford playing at home, they'll always get like a wide shot of that estate. And they did it with like Regulon the other week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they and did, yeah, when he signed. Oh, yeah, when he signed yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's I crazy that. if you like play um, like at the stadium on FIFA now, like the estate's in the background mm. when like keeper's taking a goal kick and you're just like, this is just, you know, That's it's mad, nuts. It? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's proper iconic now. You, you had a question about... Um, sort of making Brentford places iconic. Yeah, yeah, for <laughs> sure. I mean, I was literally saying to Mike the other day, um, I don't usually walk down the roads where the um, like magistrate's court is. Yeah. Uh, but I was down there for some reason the other week. And 
literally like the first thought that came to my mind <laughs> is like the justice in Brentford has been served. Yeah. <laughs> and it, I'd say it is weird how now like the show has made these just like random places. Just yeah. That the first thing you think of is the show yeah. rather than like, because that's not a court in my mind anymore. It's not <laughs> it's real place. It's just like yeah, a place where like that like. iconic <laughs> scene happens. Yeah. It's again, it was like, because we grew up around there. So whenever we thought about where to, put stuff we already had a reference in our heads it would be like if we're in a park it would be like boston manor park or yeah, Compton yeah. park or like we'd have like these places where we immediately our minds were like that's the that's where we should do mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. and uh yeah it's weird i had that now as well where it's like you'll go down uh what road is it the, like elim road where like mcdonald's is yeah, that's yeah, where yeah, Roche's yeah. house is. Yeah. I was like, oh, Roche's house. <laughs> but they wouldn't let us use that. So that's why they had to move. So there's all these weird... Oh, I've also got baggage with all of these yeah. places. Where it's <laughs> like, that fucking person wouldn't let us use their house again. <laughs> like, I mean, it, it was weird. Like, my family got really into it as well. Especially, like, I remember, like, the last episode. Yeah. Uh, when, like, Grinders leaving. I think you're, like, leaving from around, like, the Griffin or something. Yeah. And I was literally like, oh, God, that's, that's how where I drink. Like, to my family, <laughs> yeah. and it's like, what, what, they didn't really care at all. But I was like, it was such, like, a big thing for me. Are like, those seeing pubs, those places. Are they all right now? I haven't been around there for a while. It's Princess Royal is a church it's, now, is it not? Yeah, it's an uh, Armenian <laughs> church, oh, which you can't see inside. Can, we, oh, can I swear? Yeah. I yeah. Know. You can't, you can't, you can't see inside. <laughs> it's, there's something going on in there, because the original idea, I think it was going to be like a Tesco's or something. Yeah. Um, or a Sainsbury's, and now it's an Armenian church. Even which, better. You know, it's pretty cool, I guess. Uh, More niche. Uh, the, the, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the new inn, um, I kind of have a bit of just stick with there, because... They were always 21 plus, so whenever I was going around Griffin Park, I wasn't allowed in that one. Mm. So, yeah, I, I'm not going in now, just out of spite. Uh, and then because it's yeah. out of the way now, like the, all those pub, pubs that you used to go to, yeah. Like, I think so. We tend to still drink at the Griffin before home games, yeah, and just walk yeah. over like past Green Dragon Lane or onto Green Dragon Lane, then kind of go to the new stadium that way, yeah. It's yeah. Like um, quite a nice culture walk, but I don't know if uh, did, did any of the other pubs get any. I, I don't think I've been to any of the pubs since moving like around the ground. What it's the brook now, isn't it? Yeah, I think. I don't know. I don't want to get into the whole politics. <laughs> yeah. <but> I, <laughs> I think that, yeah, that, I don't think uh, that guy, you know, likes football fans too much. So yeah, it, it doesn't seem to be open mm. on match days. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I think there was he wanted a bus to be running, mm. like a match day bus from outside the brook. <laughs> there was talk wow. of which that like screams like, of desperation. Yeah, I'm um, glad some of them are doing all right still. That's yeah. nice. <laughs> it sort of feels like yeah, there must be just like a bit of a void now that that ground's not yeah. there. It I think doesn't have that same like magnet yeah. to pull everyone there. I think the Griff the Griffin still gets regular business on match yeah. days, like before and after the games. Um, Is it all the same people basically? It's just like, I'm still drinking in that. Yeah. My, <laughs> that's my pub. I'm not <laughs> going to change just because I've moved it down to Chiswick. <laughs> Literally. Well, I think they've got a good relationship with the club as well because they do like quite a lot of stuff with the mm, club. Like they I do, think yeah. the kit announcements were in the Griffin. And yeah, more pay more yeah. pay a lot of stuff yeah. there, Danny. Yeah, more pay mayhem few. or something like that. Yeah. But to Remember be fair, like the pubs sort of near the G Tech, they're not too bad. Have you have you been to like the one over the eight I think is quite a nice pub. It's it like is, on the yeah. Yeah. under Q Bridge. Uh the Express Tavern, I can't say that I've been in there for a drink, but they're not yeah, unless they want to like advertise a podcast. Yeah, no. <laughs> true. It's a good it could be, it I don't could want to tell you where pub. I drink. <laughs> <laughs> Selfies before every game. Oh, man. Well, what's good about the like when you have like a sort of routine though, as as someone who gets recognised sometimes. Yeah, it's kind of nice when everyone's kind of got used to. You. So like, yeah. you yeah, see yeah. the same faces every time. I see the same people in the same part of the stadium where I was mm -hmm. going, and it's just like now no one says anything really yeah, just yeah. like you just they, get you've like, got it out of the way they've, they've, they've <laughs> yeah, already got five photos <laughs> <and they're> like, <laughs> yeah exactly yeah they're like, oh, I don't really like need me, me one. through the years with Steve and it's yeah, yeah. Oh, he looks a bit different there, <laughs> yeah. I'll get another one just to update it having like, grown up so close to to the Griffin Park was it how did you start supporting Brentford was it like your dad's thing or was it just a kind of proximity basis it was definitely proximity but my mum was more the football fan she's she's always been the sort of uh, the one that's most sort of encouraging in terms of football mm. uh but i played for junior b's uh junior b's the, yeah the junior, <laughs> yeah for like since i was like 10 maybe or nine to when i was 15 or something so i was like there was that and then there was also the sort of you know when you're a kid and you just want a, a 
shirt or whatever. Mm. And yeah. Our parents used to let us be sort of members of the little, what was it, the little bees club or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and you get yeah. a little hat and <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. badge or whatever. <laughs> but that when you're a kid, that's sick. It's and, sick, yeah. And it's mad that that, that, that decides who you're going to support for mm. the rest of your life. You don't think about it, really. Mm. Uh, so I wasn't consciously like deciding who I liked football wise but I was I guess my parents kind of decided that yeah. for me and early, uh, early memories of Griffin Park so my main memories are like being a ball boy was sick that was like <laughs> that was like a mad sort of because I've been going there with my brother uh, when we were sort of old enough to go like alone and it was like me and my older brother and I remember that. Do you remember like Hate Corner? There was that one oh, corner yeah, that yeah. was near the away fans. Yeah. And, and we used to go there and have like, my voice is fucked today, to be fair. But <laughs> we, our voices would be so raspy after the game. And we were like these little kids, but we were trying to do like man voices. So we were, like <laughs> proper like, go on, Brentwood. Fucking come on. <laughs> and uh, that, was, that was really fun though. Because you feel like you're, you're really amongst it when yeah. you're in those sort of loud yeah, events. Yeah, definitely a lot of embarrassing moments of being a kid at football games. I remember, because we used to be in the Eden Road, maybe in like 15 or whatever, and yeah. second half when, or first half, whenever the, the away keeper was like in front of the Eden Road, we'd go to the front row and we'd just be shouting <laughs> yeah. the entire game. I remember Scott Carson, uh, who was playing for Derby at the time, we were literally just giving him what we would have thought were pelters, but probably looking back now is... Yeah. Like, <laughs> Probably just would have been laughing. No, but that's that's an important part that you were playing there. That's, yeah. that's integral to the like <laughs> the psychological warfare of the game. <laughs> yeah, so bit, uh, going back to the ball boy thing, that was like after being a supporter and uh, for, a, for a few years, the ball boy sort of element was like, made me feel like I was seeing behind the curtain a little bit and, and sort of you get to go before the game and like see the empty yeah, stadium yeah. and... We used to have to rehearse like our little running into the middle of the pitch <laughs> and then like running off to our little stalls. And it was very like undignified because it was uh, it was like division one or whatever. So it was like we didn't have proper uniforms or uh, proper sort of like we had these stalls that were like literally made of like three bits of wood sort of hammered <laughs> together. <laughs> like it was proper bad. <laughs> And uh, I, again, I sound like I'm 90 years old, fuck's sake. <laughs> but like, yeah, there was this, there was just this mad sort of uh, scene by the curtain. I remember like the guy who was sort of training us, I guess, or like sort of in charge of us, managing us, was uh, also the B. So he used to like <laughs> oh, get God. do it all, get sorted, and then be like, everyone knows what they're doing, and then he'd be in the B costume, <laughs> and, or he's just walking around without the head, just like fucking hell. That, um, I think that would score me nice. as a kid, to be fair. If I, if I yeah. saw him without the head on, oh, yeah, not damaging. Good. Yeah. No, I felt I felt privileged. I was like, <laughs> I actually know, I know the guy underneath, <laughs> <laughs> the underbelly of Brentford. Um, so yeah, that was that was some good early memories. Like my mate getting fucking slid into by like uh, I think it was like Carl Hutchins or someone just flew off the pitch and oh smashed man. his stool into pieces, <laughs> and then he had to just stand there awkwardly. Like, like if, if only he'd known that was a good opportunity to make a vodka brand afterwards. Then uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, <laughs> what have you found the the transition from Griffin Park to the new place? Like, what were your favourite parts about? the last place and like maybe some of your least favorite but to be honest like we've, yeah. we spo we, we've spoken about it. it's quite a hot topic to do Brentford fans because I don't know there's like this weird thing now a lot of the fans because we're Premier League they think the club's becoming something that it's not or it's like yeah it's we're, we're, it's... we're becoming a Premier League club in like every aspect I've, I've heard fans say that they don't really feel that sense of community with the club that they may be used to um I don't yeah. know if that's a consequence of being in the Prem or if it's a consequence of moving stadiums but what have you found like for the, from Griffin Park to the GTEC? I mean, the first, I remember the first game, the Arsenal game. Mm. Uh, there was one before that where we, where we sort of, it was like a friendly. and The Valencia and, one. Is and that, is Corrupt that? FM did a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we did like a, a song before. Yeah. That, I remember. We did like a remix of Hey Jude that we played and shit. It was like ridiculous. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that, that first actual like home game, I remember walking in and everyone was chanting yeah. and everyone was just like 
booting off. It was like amazing. Mm. And uh, and I feel like just being in that sort of, having the space and the scale of it and the, all the bars, like like the Griffin Park like bar that you used to get, we used to get beers from with the like little huts, yeah, like yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. little window <laughs> thing. And like, it's so much better, it is. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I, like you can moan about fucking all of the, I don't know, like the the money side of things or the pressures or like whatever, but the stadium's so much nicer it is and nicer, more comfortable it's, and it's, just it's, like... It's nostalgia more than anything. Yeah. Like yeah. If, if you were offered, you know, that hut, if you'd never had that hut before, you, you'd go, you know, this is shit. Yeah. It's, it's just because, you know, that, that that's a formative memory for people. And I love going to those like salt of the earth stadiums mm, like yeah they're amazing like, i was at lewis fc the other day and it, their stadium is just amazing like it's <laughs> it, one side of it's not even got like a stand it's just like a rail and people just oh, lean God. and watch yeah um I, I love those grounds but I, like we're fucking we're a big team now we yeah should, we should be in the like a fancy stadium and uh yeah so i i really enjoy it man and i feel like where uh where i am is like the the bit where everybody stands and stuff as well so there's still a good atmosphere mm. doesn't feel like any of the cultures kind of don't know died with the move yeah i don't i me. don't think it, i don't think it has I, I i wonder it scares me if we if we go down this season um yeah. touch wood that we don't but i wonder what that stadium will look like next year um defo won't be as full no but a lot of people seem to be excited about yeah, it's that. Weird. It's weird. Really? In a way, because... I don't believe it. I think it's bollocks. Like, people that say they prefer it in the championship, I just think, come on. Like, I know it's easy to say when yeah. we're in a relegation fight, but the pre- being in the Premier League, in terms of, like, the money that the club generates as well, it's, it's only good. It's only a good thing. Yeah. It's, I, it's, you can have a lot yeah. more fun, I guess, in the championship. Yeah. Just in terms of, like, it's easier to score goals. It's a bit and you more, win. <laughs> yeah. You win every week. More rewarding. <laughs> yeah. But like the yeah the Premiership man, it's like even even what well like the way that we've been playing recently, mm. the way that we've been losing hasn't been like getting obliterated by the big teams like Arsenal like beat us by one goal. Mm-hmm. It's like it's always little little wins, and obviously they <laughs> cumulatively <laughs> it's been a nightmare. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't feel like we're that out of our depth in the Premier League. So I don't I don't feel like I feel like it would be really sort of uh annoying to have to go back down and sort of prove ourselves in the championship mm. again. It's just like it'd just be an annoying sort of blip of a season, I think. Yeah. And for we sure. just and we I think we would just bounce back up. Yeah. I I'd mean, hope so. It's 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 nice now. That it feels like the first time where when people ask you who you support, it's not, you know, it doesn't sometimes they still do come back with, you know, Brent Wood or Yeah. What league what league are they in? Ben? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so it is really hard. So now it feels like the club is like standing on its own kind of, you know, identity as like an actual club. But to be fair, back in, you know, even like five years ago, whatever. I think one of the only reasons people knew what Brentford was was because of people just do nothing. Yeah. You could kind of like say, oh, you know, like people just do nothing, corrupt their family, and they go, oh, that's Brentford. And that was kind we of probably like... probably help with the investors. <laughs> <Guys>. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. That, so you kind of were before the Premier League, like that kind of thing. So the synergy between the show and the club is like definitely there. Yeah. and And they've been super like sort of encouraging of that as well like they they invited us to film various things there they're always like up for sending us like all of the merch that's in the show like angels wearing a little brentford yeah, yeah, yeah. hoodie yeah. and stuff that's all from the brentford mm-hmm. like shop they they sent us stuff they encouraged it all uh, a lot of brands are very funny about you know anything being on tv but mm-hmm. they're just like they've been really on it and i guess it's sort of like they see the value of of the show yeah, uh, which is a nice thing. What's your thoughts on the, on the current season? I, I've got a couple more questions just about purely the Brentford stuff, and then we kind of got stuff that we can that we can talk about both the show and Brentford. But yeah, what sure. was wh- how's the current season been for you as a fan? I mean, like I say, I I don't feel like we've been kind of disgraceful, but 
there's been a few games that have been really frustrating, definitely. And and I just feel like we're so injury yeah. like yeah, the injuries ridden this season. Yeah. That it's <coughs> sort of unfair to even like uh to even measure us against like what we've been able to sort of uh scrape this season. Mm. It's like I don't know. I, I feel like what we're struggling with is is the pace going forward where we're missing like Brian and we're missing Rico mm -hmm. and we're missing people that can like really get through because obviously Tony's got pace but he's sort of quite like he, he sits quite yeah, deep a yeah. lot of the time and he and he sort of does the thing of like holding the ball up and mm -hmm. then he wants somebody bursting through yeah. and like someone like Mope is not doing that really mm -hmm. he hasn't got that pace uh so I feel like the team's not quite found its like mechanics in terms of scoring goals and then we've sort of been forced to sit back more and have like five at the back and all of that stuff yeah. and then you end up with a kind of a team that are essentially trying not to concede but then I feel like we're not particularly successful at that. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it's not been the greatest season, especially after a f like a good few years of feeling like the underdog that's sort of winning yeah yeah and, and now we're sort of more cemented as just the premier league team that's not doing very well yeah, yeah. it's just weird because like this is still just like a crazy position to be in yeah um but because of those two seasons now you know people are coming up to like me and saying like what happened yeah it's like <laughs> what do you mean what happened like we're still in the premier league like this is sick yeah. like I, nothing happened this we're is just... what we were expected to be yeah like. exactly <laughs> and we've been surpassing all the expectation yeah. up until now yeah it's the expectations i think because we finished so close to europe last year it there was an expectation to kick on but i think the mm. the thing that changed was when rico got injured at newcastle and then from there i think the injuries just started to stack up and stack up but i, I yeah. feel like rico I think that's the point where you don't, don't realize how important. Yeah, is, he's he's just like pivotal to everything that we do. Um, what's the, do you because you guys are sort of knowledgeable? What's, <laughs> do you have any update on him? Or? Oh, Rico! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't think we've seen him for the rest of the season. Yeah, uh, no. I think we're supposed to be having Brian should be well. Brian came on as a sub against Burnley. Yeah, yeah. he should be back after for, for United. Uh, Ethan should be back for United, and I'm hoping Kevin Schneider will be as well. But Kind of forgot yeah. he existed. Uh, it's true. I feel like he's, I don't know, he hasn't had the chance to get going, has yeah, he? Yeah, no. no. It was just guy. when he started to get going. He scored that goal against Palace at the start of the season. Yeah, yeah. great goal. Um, yeah. And then since that, well, since the injury, I just haven't heard from him. But it's just like, I don't know what's going on with the Brentford Medical Department this year. I know. Guys, please stretch before game. <laughs> <laughs> just do, yeah, something's going, something's going wrong. Yeah. There's something going on. Those training. ice baths are uh, <laughs> making a hamstring ping or something. Yeah. Something's going weird. Yeah, it, it's very strange. Especially like how many of the injuries, I think De Silva tore his ACL in training. Yeah. I, I just think, think he, like, he's, he's a one of a kind in injuries though. That and it's so sad as well. We've yeah. spoken about De Silva loads in this podcast. Um, just in terms of how good he was in the championship. Uh, and he just hasn't really been. He hasn't just, just the injuries. He's like oh, he's never really had a sustained run in the team. Mm. Um, and we, we've kind of got players like that all over the pitch at the moment. Yeah. So like, I think I feel like now I'm definitely what well, I was, but I'm definitely now at the point where I can't wait for the season to be done. Um, and what, what do you think are our chances of staying up? <sighs> Any I, st I still I don't think we're going to go down. We've got the worrying thing is that we like you said earlier we tend to play quite well against the big teams and yeah. maybe lose by goal. Um, it's just the teams around us like Burnley the the start Reggie getting sent off within five minutes just the worst possible start what have you talked about that as well like have you have you talked about Reggie's sort of like aggression recently yeah I feel like in the last few games he was the one before that he was like super close to getting a red card I think well, um right? at West Ham he got booked within within about five minutes of the game starting and, and then he, he was, and then he was having a go at the yeah, ref like he was constantly properly, like losing his mind um he looks frustrated like i don't know what that is yeah it's weird and now we've not got him for for three games as well which uh i haven't really thought about yeah. that much but he's got a straight red card so we've, he's suspended now for three games so yeah, nice. the left side that immediate rico replacement which was their main priority in january which seemed like such a genius move to just fill the gap yeah and i mean yeah. i think he's done all right I, yeah, I feel I like a lot him. of fans have been getting on his back especially on Twitter I don't know how attuned you are to sort of the we, the Brentford <laughs> Brentford Twitter, Twitter community yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm too emotional for Twitter I can't I'm, I can't like take that sort of yeah. uh, 
I'm not comfortable sitting in those arguments. <laughs> but I yeah, to sleep. He's <laughs> he's he's. He's he's definitely just made us realise how good Rico was, and for it's sure. one of those things when you yeah. have it and he's at your club. Sometimes you're like, ah, oh, he's just we love him because he plays for us. Mm. But then you see him against like now we can compare him in our team against a former like Real Madrid, United, Spurs player, and we're like, oh yeah, no, Rico is actually the bollocks. Yeah, yeah like, that, he is good. No, no one's as good as him yeah. really. Mm. Um, I I thought we could go on to so let, let's go on to the bit of the show. Um, and I'm conscious. That obviously we we're gonna try and weave in as many as much like kind of Brentford links that I'll we try can. and bring it back. Yeah. All the time. <laughs> I think my first question and it's is I know because I've I've I'm a bit of a super fan. I've watched everything and in preparation for this, I kind of watched the some of the the BAFTA stuff that you guys did and some of the podcasts that you've done as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but my kind of burning question when I was for, for watching it for the first time was like, where the fuck did it all come from? Like, because it's such a weird idea. Yeah. Um, to. Just like where where did it come from, and then we can, I, I want to talk about ask about some characters specifically, but yeah, where yeah. did it come from? Uh, so it was I guess it's like one of those things where it's like lots of different inspirations that sort of all formed into one thing. But uh, there was definitely like The Office, yeah, being the sort of like the mockumentary style that we all loved and were obsessed with, and there was also like. Uh, it was around the time of like MySpace and stuff like that. So we, me and uh, Hugo, who plays Beats, mm -hmm. we had like a a kind of fake garage crew that we were doing because he was producing. So we would MC over these like garage beats that he'd made, and it was called Blazing Unit. And mm. the, the lyrics were stupid; they were just like freestyles. <laughs> like we didn't write anything, but it was like we had these kind of characters. So it was like Rago Merkic three thousand. <laughs> Uh, things and Stevie Baseline B and that was like a very early sort of embryo of what sort of evolved into being Corrupt FM I think mm. and uh, when I met Sipa who plays Grinder, he was kind of just a clown like he was so funny and had loads of these like uh, characters that he would sort of snap into and, and we started sort of bonding over this like like we basically met and went to Thailand like at the same time, which is a bit of a mad thing to do. Mm. But uh, we came up with this like thing of pretending to be on pills all the time. So we were like <laughs> at these like, like these kind of full moon parties where people were on drugs, but we weren't. <laughs> and we were just going up to him like, yes, bro, where are you from? Bro? <laughs> just like hugging like these fucking like topless, really intense guys and just being like, where are you from, bro? Like, is, it, just winding people they, up. is this the, the character that Grinder does it so well in Club Night? Is that is that, that yeah. character? <laughs> it's just and, like... and I think well, it sort of created Steve's in a way. Yeah. And then, yeah, he was almost a bit fuming that he didn't get to play that character. Like, because he does it so well. Because he, he has got a history of like pills and like being in that scene sort of like back in the day like ethnographic uh, yeah you know. so there's some he's he's the one with the most on point observations <laughs> of all that stuff and uh yeah when we met so we started playing around with these characters and then we were sort of like oh we should film something that's like the blazing unit sort of thing but like we sort of evolved it into corrupt fm mm. and then created like so we created steve's grinder beats and then uh, there was a documentary called Tower Block Dreams that mm -hmm. was like a very sort of like it was just funny because it was so the people involved in the uh, documentary was so hilarious and deluded. <laughs> but it was very similar to what we were sort of playing around with because it was set in this pirate radio world. And we were like, the pirate radio world hasn't really been like tapped into. Like no one really knows that much about the pirate radio scene and it the music around it's sick that like all of the sort of uh things that we loved like even the fashion and stuff mm. was like all kind of part of this thing so we we were like that would be an amazing thing to do a fake documentary about the pi like these pirate radio guys and then we just yeah we just started filming it basically we sort of got together in like someone's bedroom and just had a geezer with a camera and we just all fucked around and said things and then like we would say you know like oh m your girl Mish is like <laughs> whatever so then we had to invent a girl we had to get a girl involved and it was like my girlfriend at the time Lily yeah got her to be Mish 
And then we were like, yeah, because you've got a kid with me. And, and then it was like, uh, so I got my <laughs> goddaughter involved as the kid, but she's mixed race. So then we we're like, oh, that would be funny though, because he couldn't be like, Deco, yeah, yeah. And, then, and <laughs> Dan, who plays Deco, was literally just like, he was sort of the driver. Like he would, he would drive Sipa to these like meetings where we were filming and whatever, and he'd just be there. And then we're like, you should be in it, man. Just put a cap on. Like, and, then, <laughs> and he was super quiet. Like, he just plays himself basically. So, yeah, but, like, uh, kind of like unintentionally. Like when people write themselves in a cor- into a corner to see how they can get out, it's like yeah. you're accidentally saying something. It's like, okay, like how is this a new plot point? Like, exactly, and that's way. that's what good improv is. Really, yeah. it's like you're just sort of figuring out how you can react to somebody else's like thing so they'll say uh you love that don't you and then you've got to be like yep (laughs) (laughs) whatever it is you have to go along with it so it's like it's fun to play around with um but yeah that's sort of how it started that was the that was the like the sort of evolution at the beginning and then once we put a few videos on youtube it it started to pick up a bit of traction Mm. and uh this was in the times where there wasn't as many sort of, I guess, uh, influencery sort of social media, ju- like people making money off social media. Mm. But uh, we used it to get a pilot, essentially. And yeah. Were, you, were you marketing the YouTube series or like posting it anywhere? Or did it just a little really bit, but grassroots get traction somehow? The, thing, the things that made it get traction was uh, Lily Allen posted it okay. and Professor Green posted it yeah. in the very early days and then we just like got like we had 1,000 views and then we had 10,000 views mm, suddenly. Yeah. But even that, it wasn't it was like literally that amount. It wasn't like a hundred thousand views. It was it was small numbers comparatively to like what you see now, but it was enough to get the pilot. And then the company who approached us was the Asher Taller's company. Mm-hmm. So he did the office. So yeah. it's just like this perfect thing of like, oh shit, we can we can literally work with our hero yeah. to make mm. something similar, and he gets it obviously. Was it was it always going to be that this group are from Brentford? Like, was there any other places in the running, or was it just did, did it make sense to just do it where you guys were from? Yeah, it just made sense, and and we filmed. I think the second video we filmed was uh, just going through Brentford McDonald's drive through with a tenner <laughs> yeah. and doing like all of the sort of improvising with that basically. So that immediately sort of cemented that it's Brentford, and then. Yeah, it just made sense because we're writing about an area that we know. So we we were just always kind of like picking the right spots mm. to uh, where we thought, you know, these people would hang out. What would they be doing? And it's just easier than it's easier to use what you know than to just be trying to say it in like uh, up north where I don't have any points of reference. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Did you have a lot of say like when using the locations in Brentford's obviously once it got picked up? outside people would have been getting involved were you very like being those kind of knowledgeable people going we have to use this estate we have to yeah, use a little this location kind of it was a bit of like th- they were very respectful to our opinions so they would they would sort of say like what do you think of this and we would like have a say but yeah. uh yeah it was a bit of us suggesting and other people we obviously had like location people that would find good places as well mm. uh but it was it was important it was all set around the real like West London. Even if we cheated some stuff and made it like Acton Estate and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. But it got more difficult as it got bigger because then people start going, well, where's our money? Like, <laughs> mm. or what's, like, are you are you taking the piss out of our estate or whatever? Mm. Like, it's cool people just do nothing. So it's sort <laughs> of got a slightly negative vibe. <laughs> and, uh, and, and there was definitely some like, people on on green dragon estate that didn't like us after a while Mm. and and were sort of like making it difficult so that was that was a bit awkward (laughs) but i think overall people from brentford like the show i hope Uh, so it's when it first came out and it was about brentford or i can't even remember when i first watched it but i was just i was just it was quite shit me up that it was brentford because i'd never seen brentford in the mainstream media and then it was like all of a sudden there's this documentary series on on the bbc and these guys are based in brentford and it's like it's like you said earlier like i was seeing stuff on the telly that i only see on a saturday yeah in terms of the in terms of yeah. roche's house 
which is just opposite the Princess Royal and, and the estate and everything. Um, so it's like, I, I don't understand if I wouldn't, I, I don't understand how there are Brentford fans who haven't seen it. If you know what I mean, yeah. Because for yeah, me, was, for me, as yeah. a, for me as a Brentford fan, I saw it and was like, oh wow, I've got to watch this. It's about Brentford almost. In there, a way. there was a jump to have like almost ownership over it. I guess as yeah. Brentford fans, <laughs> like, I remember I went to one of the Corrupt Film shows at the Roundhouse. I think it was yeah. like 2017. Nice. So like, was that when I was in a harness <laughs> come down from the I, ceiling? I think like that big nasty oh, that performed or, or something. <laughs> and came out is when you had like the sheet and it dropped. Oh yeah, I think. yeah, yeah. But that was like sick, but uh, not, none of my mates were Brentford fans, so I went with. But yeah. I had like a spare Brentford shirt, and one of them was like, I have to wear a Brentford shirt. Like, yeah. And then suddenly we met like other people in Brentford shirts in the crowd. Yeah. And suddenly, like, even though it was like, what, however many thousand people were there, we were like, nah, this is our show. Like, we're wearing the Brentford <laughs> yeah, we're shirt. The <laughs> yeah, we're the proper Like, you see other people having a good time, it's like, yeah, but like, I'm wearing. Like, yeah, you don't is... really know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you don't know the lads like I do. <laughs> But yeah, we see it at festivals and shit. Like you'll be like at like Reading Festival or something, and yeah. there'll just be like a, a load of geezers in the front row with like Brentfordshire. <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> but it's like the only time like, Brentfordshire was never like a a, a a fashion choice, was it? But no. suddenly it was something you could wear to this show. Yeah. I don't know. In like a, I don't know what they do, like Taylor Swift concerts. Or <laughs> no you know, idea. Like the necklaces yeah. or something. Maybe. Yeah. yeah, I've actually got an, a Brentford necklace. Yeah. Oh, Have you got yeah. a Brentford tattoo? No, I, got, oh. I don't have any tattoos. I've, I saw something on your Insta, and it was on it was a it was a Brentford crest on someone's ankle, but it's oh, not yeah. not your ankle. I can't even remember when that was, but uh, no, it would have just been me being a creep and just like taking <laughs> photos on his ankle. I just like I I do like that sort of I do like that sort of those sort of tattoos. They feel those are the tattoos I like, the sort of old school ones where yeah, it's like yeah. the things that you love. You've got your wife's name there, you've got <laughs> your football chain there. Like it's, yeah. it's all just like the key things. <laughs> yeah. I sort of, yeah. You, I me- really like those you mentioned that episode that you put on YouTube when it was you guys going through the McDonald's. Um, in terms of like, I was watching that and it's quite grinder, especially. It's very intense in that. Yeah. So when you were like taking it from YouTube to TV, was it difficult? Did you have to do any kind of like toning down? Did you have to adapt what you'd originally thought about and but you obviously still want to make it as authentic as possible so yeah. like, what was that process kind of like it was i guess it's always a slight battle of like realism versus uh funny as well but um that's sort of the biggest battle but yeah we definitely had to do a lot of work on sort of separating who the characters were so it's like gr- beats and grinder were sort of similar and both quite aggressive and both <laughs> quite like rude <laughs> and we were like how can we make beats more like d- sort of unique so we made him sort of more subservient <laughs> and a bit more of a sort of pathetic character in a way which hugo hated at first <laughs> but, but it worked for the show and it made it way funnier uh but yeah grinders because we like shows like you know like even like the office is brent's not that likable a lot of the time and uh and even like kenny powers and people like that that you see mm. on big shows but they're really horrible characters like and and it's funny we sort of were justifying grinder being a bit of an arsehole by using those kind of yeah, references yeah. uh but it's like ultimately it's it comes down to if it's funny then it wins in comedy mm. and like if it's well observed if the joke is that he's like really aggressive and like that's what somebody like him would be like but it's not funny then it we wouldn't be able to get away with that yeah and people would be like we need to make it funny somehow yeah so that was always the battle it's like we wanted it to be realistic but we also needed it to be funny and uh not just like make people feel uncomfortable <laughs> 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 how, how much of uh the show because i've heard you speak about sort of Obviously, you you did English Lit at uni, right? Yeah. So you had some experience writing before you did the show. So, yeah, sort of. Like reading. Yeah. Mind, mind yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but like in terms but yeah, of like scripts. I, I, was, I was pretty literate compared to like uh, some of the other boys just weren't interested in writing whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And I was the one that was kind of like, when we had the opportunity to write something, I was like, I'll definitely do that. Mm. I remember turning up to meetings and I always had like a pad and a pen. <laughs> so it was like, I was really trying to say like, I'm a, I'm the writer. Like, <laughs> just just make sure you know. 
Um, but like I said, the origin, the sort of stuff that we did on YouTube was so improvised that it wasn't really, mm-hmm. there wasn't really a writing job in there. It was like more producery, I guess. We were sort of organizing stuff. But uh, when it got to, yeah, when it got to scripts, that was a massive learning curve and it was all just fucking trial and error really yeah. like people kind of reading your stuff and being like oh, I don't know if this is really <laughs> working and, and like we were trying to find the tone of it like I remember the, one of the early scripts that we wrote where Griner got out of prison and we had this whole scene of Beats being interviewed and in the background you just hear like smashing like just really loud sex basically and then <laughs> at the end of the interview Griner just comes out and he's like he's come out of prison and he's had sex with me and that was like we thought that that was like hilarious but then those are the kind of scenes where you're just like, actually, is that, a bit, <laughs> is that a bit weird? Does it become a little bit sort of like, I don't know, this, this sort of problematic shit that, yeah, we, were, that yeah. we were very like, um, we had to be pulled up on a few times, I think, mm. in those early stages. And luckily, Rough Cut were not judgmental of us. They were like supportive and they were respected that we were, you know, we had a raw sense of humor. Pushing the boat out a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You got to, yeah. Um, how much of the of the show was like improvised, and and as a follow up, what's like something that we wouldn't know was improvised, but it turned out to be like a fucking hilarious moment in the show. Ah, uh, there's loads of improvised stuff, but mostly the talking heads, like mm. when people are being interviewed, that's pretty much. There'll be like it's probably about one in ten of them will be written, mm. and then the rest will be improvised. Right. So okay. the, uh, stuff that's improvised. I mean, some of your buddy's stuff, like, I remember him when he goes into the mother care and he's just going up to all the mums and just, like, flirting with all the... That was just <laughs> as him being ridiculous, yeah. going up to all these, like, essays. <laughs> and some of them were, might might have even been real people. So we would do it, like, in places where there was actually... Like, when we shot on Brentford High Street, we didn't close off the high street. We had real people that we were going up to and talking to. So all of that stuff's improvised. All of the um, there's there's just so many little bits. There's so many things where you like, where you sort of try stuff on the day, and you're just like, maybe that was a bit m- too much or whatever, <laughs> and like, and then it it ends up in the cut, and you're like, oh shit, it kind of worked. Yeah. <laughs> As the show went on, it must have been difficult because obviously you would have been getting more comfortable, and I assume like better at writing at that stage. Yeah. And you knew what you're doing. Gets easier. So you, but yeah. then also at the same time, you must have known those characters so well. So you probably could just improvise an entire scene like yeah. as your character. So it must I'll have been quite you... a hard battle between like both of those getting to a good stage. Yeah, but that was the joy of it was that like there was always a the director, Jack Clough, he always allowed that room to like. So we'd have the scene and then we'd he wouldn't say cut after the scene had finished. He would just let it keep going. Mm. And and even while we're doing the scene, sometimes we would be adding little bits, and then we would get carried away, and and he would come in after the take and be like, "Do do that again, but don't do that bit." So it sort of become like a refining process where we're improvising, yeah. but actually we're crafting a new scene out of the good bits until we have the sort of complete thing. One one thing that was all improvised was the orange thing, you know, oh, where yeah. fantasy takes yeah. the orange. Oh, yeah. So that. The orange was written in where he he takes the orange, but then everything after the door shuts was all just improvised mm. and like him him saying like yeah I was just holding it man I was just I was just pretending to <laughs> heal it and me being all excited and then Beats coming in and we explained to Beats what happened. We had like we had a bit after that where I called Grinder and told him the whole story on the on on the phone and then. Like there's a bit where he comes into the studio later and we were like, let's tell him the story again. So it, it just became this ridiculous thing. We went way too far of it. <laughs> but in the end, it was like we used loads of it and it was it was really funny. Mm. I, I want to ask about Chabuds just in general, because obviously his character yeah. is not from that music background. But you so you were mates with Asim before yeah, the show he, started. He was kind of friends more with like Hugo and uh, Sipa because they were doing like rap stuff. Mm-hmm. So he was a rapper and he was also making like music videos and doing like weddings or corporate videos and stuff so he had a camera and uh sound recording equipment th- things mm. and, uh, <laughs> this kind of stuff yeah, yeah. All that, all this sort of shit. 
and he he was yeah he filmed some of it and then we had this he had this character that he used to do prank calls with called your buddy g where mm -hmm. he used to like ring places up and be doing that voice kind of thing and then <laughs> it was like we were like what if you what if we dressed you like in a in, like as your buddy and and you could actually like do a whole your buddy bit and he was meant to just be a little character in the mm. background. He was meant to be like a little fixer that would come and sort the aerial out. But he just, he's just fucking ridiculous. And he's, he's so, so funny. funny. He's so funny. And it became like that thing that I was talking about with the trying to balance the realism with the comedy. Mm -hmm. He became the thing that was allowed to be ridiculous and just made it a comedy show, like obviously mm -hmm. in, a, in a way. And Steve's a little bit as well, but like he was so big as a character yeah. and so like broad and funny that like yeah you could you couldn't mistake it for a no, documentary you, you, anymore you'd never be able to take a scene with him <laughs> in it seriously yeah I think you'd always know it's a comedy at that point and and, it was him. and i think we that's where we got the right balance was like we had the sort of the grinders sort of stuff is a lot more subtle and it would be like sort of those little nuances of yeah. social interactions or whatever but your buddy just fucking clowning about just like it, it created it made it a, a bigger show and a bigger sort of uh more widely accepted show i think by having him in it yeah and, and him doing his thing me and my mates all use your buddy's voice like <laughs> we've got like yeah i was like i was like should i do that? I, don't <laughs> yeah. know I, I don't know how much I, I use it a lot when i'm like in the rooms with them and everything but yeah it's uh it's in terms of his character is kind of because he's he's done loads of stuff like off the back of it. Yeah, yeah. His he's like transcended the show almost in, in a weird yeah. way because he's got like he's his like own personality and it's like blown, yeah, he's yeah. like a TV personality now. Yeah, yeah. it's quite funny. Um, I want to talk. I've got a couple more questions about the show and then stuff about because I do want to chat about sort of the music stuff that's kind of happened after his Planet Festivals must be really fun. Yeah. Um, I saw you at Reading in 2016, I think. Maybe my first Reading festival that I went to. Oh, yeah. Probably. And it was I sick. I actually was there as well. And it was sick. Yeah, no, it was class. Yeah, um, yeah. we were in the same tent. So I, I want to talk about that for a bit as well. Uh, but I do want to ask you, like, how did it feel kind of winning a BAFTA? Because, like, did you... Obviously, you are up against... Was it... Uh, Fleabag. Fleabag. Yeah. yeah that, Fleabag. That is, looking back, that is crazy. Yeah. That is mad, but, yeah. And I've... I think at the time, we, we'd been nominated the year before... And, and not won it and we were kind of like well we're not expected to win so we were a bit uh it's weird because you have to prepare to win in a way <laughs> and we literally had we had the disabled uh exec so we had we knew that if we won there would have to be a ramp onto the stage mm. that they would have had to think about mm -hmm. so when we were there there was no ramp and we were like we ain't won <laughs> that was how we knew we hadn't won and then when it did happen we were all like genuinely just like fuck it was like at the time it's sort of horrible because i i'm i'm too anxious to be getting up in front of yeah. like all these heroes and yeah. like it was terrifying i genuinely had so much adrenaline i felt like i was in a fight <laughs> and i was like didn't know what to say i was just like <laughs> um but ash who was supposed to be talking because he was like he said before if we win i'd love to like talk and mm. i was like yeah do it man i'm fully down i don't i don't want to say anything <laughs> but because there was no ramp he had to be taken all the way around yeah and it left us just on stage with no <laughs> we hadn't prepared anything because we thought he was going to talk and then yeah we were just sort of stuttering until he finally appeared from the wings and then uh got the bafta but yeah it was an amazing horrible but like the best thing ever experience that's like all at once when you're actually having to get up in front of everyone for me other people probably just love that stuff but uh i think like retrospectively i did watch it the other day and it just the whole speech and everything did embody the like spirit of the show so much like when yeah. you I, I can't remember it's like someone shouts like pure corruption at the end yeah. kind of character like, that felt like so counterculture and like everything yeah. the show kind of stood for oh, that's good like yeah. shouting it in front of all these you know like the hollywood kind of people yeah it, it did I don't know. It hit well. I think. It was it was chaotic, but that's how we. I think that's how we got away with a lot of stuff. Like even going on, sort of, even doing festivals, even being on TV shows or whatever. It's always like, it's always kind of chaotic, and they know that it's going to be a bit like. Uh, there's going to be some vulgar shit happening. <laughs> there's going to be some like. There's going to be some chaos. I can go on there and pretend I'm 
like fucked basically, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is always a nice like place to start. <laughs> and uh, and like as a DJ, like doing shows, like you're sort of not expected to be that good at DJing either. So like if if I if I clang a mix, I'm like oh, Steve's clanged it, not me. Like, that's, <laughs> it's realism, guys. I can't be too good. It'd be weird if Steve was really good at DJ. So like you, it's sort of a, an amazing excuse for getting away with a lot of stuff. I do have like a really bad segue, but I just, I've always wanted to ask this question because I, I thought about it so much at the time. Sure. When you um like took Post Malone's was it cigarette or whatever oh, yeah, smoking. Yeah. When you mind like obviously like sharing you, you don't know where his mouth's been yeah. it's, it's such a good bit but like where you like in your head like the Is steve stamp is going out like oh. <laughs> 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 no you know what uh i was quite I, if anything i was sort of excited that he gave it to me yeah because <laughs> i thought he might be a bit like i thought that might break him yeah but he just played along and then i was like i was so in it and as i as i got it i knew that this would be a like this is the best thing that I could do as Steve's in yeah. this moment is punch a little bit of a saves of his cigarette. I know. So even most... saying like saves in front of like a big American yeah, star, I don't even know what that means <laughs> yeah. at all. It's just like oh, it's so great. Yeah. So I was. I think all I was thinking was yes. Like he gave me. <laughs> I had another one like that with Wiz Khalifa. Um, we were we were doing interviews at the Red Bull Culture Clash, and it was like there's footage on online. Uh, it was like various like big artists that we had to sort of interview and Wiz Khalifa appeared with his like crew and they're smoking these loud zoots that just <laughs> stink of skunk and, and obviously I'm Steve so I, I like I offered to look after their like weed for them basically that was like the joke I had in my head I'm gonna yeah. like I'm gonna say that I have to confiscate your weed because it's like because that's the rules of the venue or whatever. <laughs> and um and he was like, oh no, he just sort of laughed and he was like, oh you want this? And I was like, I have to. Yeah. <laughs> so I I like took it and straight away again. It was like, oh man, I d I don't want to be blazing <laughs> right now. I'm about to be interviewing like popcorn or something. <laughs> <laughs> but I took. <clears throat> I I'm choking even thinking about it. <laughs> I, took, I took like a couple bun of this zoo and it spanned me. It was like this, <laughs> it was the most potent weed that Kali Khalifa I can't think of anything worse than that. And then I was yeah. just like, yeah, just blazed. Then you were Steve. And then, yeah. <laughs> and then I'm in character. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that, that sort of stuff is like, it's ridiculous, but it's all part of the experience, I guess. Yeah. How and much? Pe uh, and people, um, I think people notice that shit as well. Yeah. They're like, he actually got Wiz Khalifa's zoo. Like, yeah, it's like you know what I mean. If I was, if I saw that, I would be, I'd be impressed. So, uh, I have to, I have to live up to my own expectations. How much of the, how much influence would you say West London had on the show? Obviously, it's based in Brentford, but just yeah. in terms of like, and I want to talk about the culture of sort of the music and the clothes as well. Yeah. Um, but just like just West London, I guess maybe just like all three of those things because I, I think those are the most like. Yeah, Important West London, because we all went to school in West London. It was all that era of like those kind of uh, those kind of clothes and those trainers and mm -hmm. those like brands and those all of those things that you see in the show are very deliberately uh, chosen and and that was a massive part of like almost like revisiting our school selves and like what we would have wanted to wear. Mm. And like, what would have happened if we hadn't sort of like changed our style, <laughs> gone to uni and started wearing like trousers and fucking <laughs> like old man jumpers? Chinos. That, yeah. that episode where Beats puts on chinos. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like it was like going back to being like your sort of year nine self, but like as a like as a man. <laughs> and uh, in that sense, like West London is all sort of all important because it's it's where we all learn all of the all of that music where we learn like all of those references where we where we sort of formed all of our uh our friendships and like yeah there's so much of west london in in the show obviously um and and i guess it's just like we have so much love for West London and so much love for especially Brentford that like it was it was exciting for us to be able to like you say like 
for us to create a show that people go fucking that's Brentford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. that's that's what that's why we did it so that people could sort of react like that. That's that's uh, that's a beautiful thing. So it's like how they used slough in the office or whatever. Yeah, but, yeah. But we wanted to do it even more. <clears throat> even more respectfully in a way like and have the detail of it and the um and the community of it and the sort of the it's all about friendships and family and uh following your dreams and everything so mm. it was uh, all of that stuff uh we wanted to sort of infuse with the like west london culture you know what i mean yeah so yeah hopefully that's what we did even for like garage itself like that is making <clears> some <throat> kind of mainstream comeback at the moment in yeah in a different form and you know you speed garage and kind of thing but that is kind of i'm seeing obviously like sammy virgin people like that yeah. are very different to yeah like conductor what and them, people. But yeah. Like yeah. they're now playing america and people know them in america yeah like he's like collaborating with a lot of like the big american artists now and yeah, that's yeah, kind yeah. of hitting the mainstream so yeah and again it's like we didn't there wasn't many shows that had garage on the soundtrack yeah so we were like very particular about we need to have these tracks we would get like special uh permission from like back in the day producers to be able to use their music or they would give us like new stuff like uh like wide boys i remember just making us like a whole load of new tunes just so we yeah could just for the show it. yeah That's and so like yeah <laughs> and yeah to respect to like all the people that helped that like scott garcia as well we sort of uh he gave us loads of loads of music back in the day and there's there's a definitely a few there's a few producers that really got behind the show um oh, i'm trying to think and i feel like my mind's gone blank now <laughs> but yeah anyway Shout out to them. They know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think one of the most underrated characters in the whole show for me is uh, is Roche. Um, just uh, her one liners are just brilliant. Her she's so dry. Yeah. But she. So, what was it like casting people for roles that weren't your mates? If that, if that makes sense. Because yeah. obviously the four of you were mate. You knew each other before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's people that came into the show. Yeah, it was it was weird. Uh, it was about finding people that could do the improvising and could react to us and our, mm. our sort of audition process was a lot of like just performing with us not even scripted stuff just did you give him any kind of warning about like what it was gonna be <laughs> maybe i'm not even sure <laughs> probably but she is like ruth brat she is a master of improv like she does like improv uh theater shows where they like ask for a word and then they improvise a whole play and stuff it's like crazy like mm. her her mind is so sharp when it comes to that stuff so she just nailed it and roche wasn't supposed to look like her she was not supposed to be like ruth really but she was so funny that we just changed it all and mm. made it into her and then and then it just became funny because she had this blokishness about her <laughs> and we just thought like we lent into that the security and the sort of beats being a little bit scared <laughs> of her and like it just created so much funny shit i mean speaking of people who transcend the show like craig at the moment and like oh my his God. tiktoks that TikTok threw, stuff, threw yeah. me off so much when I, I realized it was him but i saw him recently right because yeah. we cast him for peacock which oh, is, yeah, i yeah, should yeah. mention as well peacock coming out on the uh, iplayer and june i think series two but the first series is available now <laughs> um, but he he's in the next series of peacock and he i i was like oh, what's he gonna be like is he gonna be this sort of mad like camp tiktok guy that he turned <laughs> yeah. into but he was normal he's just doing it he's doing a character on tiktok yeah. to wind everyone up and it's like i don't know how i feel about it but yeah he's he has transcended the show like you yeah. say he's become this like I don't know, this TikTok sort of uh, troll, basically. It's like a wind-up <laughs> merchant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is crazy. It's just in so many ways, the show kind of did just latch onto so many things that are now, like, massive, but at the time, kind of... Yeah. You know, you, you got ahead of the curve in so many ways. Yeah, I sort of wish he hadn't uh, gone so heavy into the TikTok stuff. <laughs> He's a good actor, man. He should be he should be doing more acting. Yeah, my, my dad's favourite character, like, hands down, was yeah. Craig. He, He's unbelievable. He'll never forget him. <laughs> yeah, and he was he was very real as well. Like, when we first cast him, he, he was very raw and he wasn't professional. And then Series 2, when it started doing all right, he came out and just was on it and he learned his lines and he was just like a different mm. character like he was a different man 
he was sort of evolving with the show, which was like an amazing thing. Do you do you have sort of favourite one-liners, favourite episodes from the show? Honestly, I don't even remember no? half of the stuff. I know because people say stuff to me. So yeah. I, I remember Steve's stuff that people always repeat where it's like, I don't have a problem with drugs. And there's all one, the problem with drugs one is a good one, but there's one where you walk into your nan's care home and you're picking up the care package and you just say, I'll have what he's having, he looks fucked. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, yeah. that was my favourite one. That was a funny bit of casting. We're like, which guy should, looks the most <laughs> Yeah, um, oh, I don't even know. There's like, there's moments for me that that I remember where I'm like, I remember trying so hard not to laugh and then not laughing and being like, there's a sort of feeling that you get when you know you've waited long enough that we've got it and then you, and then you can laugh. And one of them was uh, when Grinder's sick on me. <laughs> and it was like it was so hard not to laugh because he just like properly it was just like all over me but then as he came away he like spat on my shoulder like in my face basically and I, I was like that was it was such a good detail and it was so disrespectful and just like Steve's had just helped him up it was like such a lovely thing that Steve's is like helped him back to life and then he just like <laughs> spits on him <laughs> and i was like that is just like like we're talking what we're talking about with grinder being like a bad person or whatever and it's like that was so horrible but it was so funny because it was perfect for that moment mm -hmm. and uh yeah i remember holding it just not laughing just like if i can get through this this is an amazing take yeah and like you know you don't want to fuck it up <laughs> yeah there's a lot of, there's a lot of funny um moments where you're just like you're just trying so hard not to ruin it <laughs> by laughing and it's so hard like beats i can't look at beats when he's when he's being when he's being funny like i can't even look him in the eye because he's i just he gets me every time there was one scene where he had to i had to open the bathroom door and he was like on the phone looking at pictures of jody marsh <laughs> and that was like that was just a funny little idea, but like every time I, <laughs> every time I open the door and he's just sitting there, looking up at me with this like, and he had a different picture of Jody Marsh every <laughs> time, and he was just like, he knew what he was doing, but yeah, couldn't do it. Like it took about hundred takes to get to that, but it's all it's part of the fun, I guess. There's there's one on YouTube. Um, there's one not on YouTube, but I've, li I've been looking for it for so long. It's Grinder and Beats. They're talking to the camera at the end of the episode. And they're talking about prices and how there's no worth it. He says something like, "You can't, you can't put a price on that." And, yeah. then, and then he just says, "We're worthless." We're worthless. At the end, and then he just yeah. cuts. <laughs> I've, I've been looking for that clip for so long. Uh, I can't remember what episode it's on. But that was written. That one. Yeah, I'll that... take. I'll take that one. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was me. That one. Yeah, that's but, a good one. Yeah, that's really good. In terms of uh, the music stuff, I did want to ask, what was it, what's the best festival that you've played at, and what's one that you want to play at? Uh. I think Glastonbury's got to be up there. Mm -hmm. Like, just the scale of it is just so mad. Uh, but we had, like, a tent at Best of All one time that was, like, our own tent, and we had the, we did the line-up and everything. That's sick. I feel like that was probably a highlight, uh, festival-wise. Also, Outlook, when we were doing the sort of international, like, festivals, and, mm -hmm. uh, like, Outlook was mad. We did a boat party where we... They wanted us to film content, so we were like, "Can we get jet skis and <laughs> go to the boat party on jet skis?" And and they were like, "Yeah." So we were like, "Fucking hell, this is going to be amazing!" <laughs> uh, but then the the reality <laughs> version of it, which is always the thing that's amazing, is like, we thought we were going to be pulling up on jet skis. What happened was they they said they couldn't let us drive the jet skis for safety reasons, so there had to be like these random guys <laughs> that we oh, were yeah. like, we the waist. <laughs> and then we were just like, it was sort of weirdly degrading. <laughs> and I was wearing water wings because I thought it'd be funny that Steve can't swim. And uh, so it was just like, yeah, those are the things that you almost like are unexpected, like perfect things that get added in because of just like life. Life always shits on on you yeah. like it's never as it's never as cool as you think it's going to be <laughs> you always end up like walking around Glastonbury with a tent trying to find where you're going or whatever <laughs> like it's, it's always degrading sort of moments but then we we use that and then make it into the like the next 
series will have a scene where somebody has to hold on to some guy's waist or whatever. You know what I mean? <laughs> mm. Yeah. What would be, what, what was it like doing your first show off the back of the People Just Do Nothing? Was it, was it, was it nerve wracking? What, the music Yeah, stuff? yeah. Uh, it was like, it was weird because we were... You were in beginning. character in it as yeah. well, yeah. And I was DJing and I had vinyl because I thought we had to be purist about it. Like, they wouldn't use CDJs. They mm. would hate CDJs. They'd want to use vinyl. So I was turning up to Ray's with vinyl and, like, mm. going on, like, I wasn't even that good at mixing. Like, even back in the day, I was never that great a DJ. But that was, like, suddenly I'm trying to rediscover my DJing skills live in front of loads of people in a rave and like every clang is like horrible yeah uh so that was tough and i remember going on after like ez one time at like in like it's a tough act to follow <laughs> yeah and he just shelled it and then i got up and was like doing mixes that took like five minutes because i was trying to get it in time for ages and like Ugh. it was yeah that was that was stressful um and then gradually got more and more comfortable, sort of made the transition to CDJs because it's so much easier and you can just take a USB. Yeah. Uh, and then once I got sort of, once I realized I could do that, it was just, that was just fun. And then we just got like, had a great run. Just I guess you always have the fallback of it kind of is believable if you mess up because Steve's maybe would just be out of it for a second. And <laughs> yeah. <forget. just> like, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's been like, it's been years now of doing these festivals and, and we're still getting those offers and uh, we're doing Glastonbury, I think I can announce this uh, this year. So that's going to be great. And it's like 10 years of Corrupt FM uh, this year. Ends so off. nice. we're going to do like a big show to be announced shortly. But uh, that will be a special one. As, as well. in just like a, like your, just your own show? Yeah, not like, like a, a festival. Big, oh, yeah, a nice, big live nice. show, yeah. That'd be fast. Uh, I don't know if I can say anything about that. <laughs> Keep it'll your be, eyes peeled. Yeah, it'll be announced soon. It'll be, I think, in September or something. Nice. Yeah. Sick. Just to bring things back to Brentford before we kind of round things off. Um, yeah. I know I mentioned at the top of the show, like the cult following of the of the show, um, and it still is a like to a certain extent true these days. Um, especially if you just ask people, people like it's like I said at the start. Yeah. People that I told about that we were getting you on the show that mm. have seen the show were like, "That's fucking sick." Yeah. Um, Everyone who knows is like enthusiastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No one. Yeah. I feel I've, I've not met one person who's like watched the show and it's just like, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's. I think it becomes people's like people's thing that they just watch as a comfort like yeah. so mm. a lot of people say that they just put it on all the time and it's like oh so I, I watched it um, i'd watched it before but my girlfriend hadn't watched it so i was really nervous to show her this show but she knew i supported yeah. brentford right um i was really nervous to show her the show i was like kind of like a rite of passage yeah, <laughs> almost i was like if you find this funny like that's really yeah. good yeah so we started but yeah no it was good and when she she comes to the brentford games with me now so like yeah. when we're when we're like in and around Brentford, I'm like, oh, she's she's looking at this huge tower block. She's like, oh, it's from the show. It's quite funny. Yeah. Um. But like, what's it like for you walking around, going to the games, Brentford? I know you mentioned it at the start, but just yeah, being in Brentford, it's, it's nice. I feel like there's a nice, uh, I'm sort of a nice level of famous where I I get recognised and it's all love and it's like because it's my show, as well. Like it's not like I'm famous for being like a in a go compare advert or something <laughs> it's like i'm recognized for the work that i've put in like i've spent fucking years of my life making the show so now the fact that people are like fans of it is is a reward and uh it's just like i'm just proud to to have like done something that people like mm. uh and yeah in terms of going to brentford it's like like i say there's a sort of there's the immediate people around me at the at the ground that sort of have already got it out of their system and they now we just say hello yeah uh i've just got a lot of random mates now because of it mm -hmm. basically yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's it's a nice perk i think that would be a good place to round things off to be fair yeah, I, there see was your eyes flitting to the side <laughs> <laughs> we've been told to get out it wasn't a nice place to round it off we're being told to leave <laughs> camera cut now. i was so there, there's there is something that i forgot to mention in the intro we, d we do have a tradition on the podcast where we get uh, a guest if we get a guest on to tell their funniest brentford story i should have pictured it at the start so that you had time to think about it oh fuck um 
but yeah, if you've got a funny bit, and then I was also wondering if you could, <laughs> and this is a stretch, sure. give 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 it a little Steve's outro for the podcast. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. that that might that might be cool. I think that could yeah. be quite funny. Um, uh, so unless you can story. think of yeah a funny story, and we can wrap things up because we are being told to leave. <laughs> <laughs> um, funniest Brentford story. Just give me about ten minutes. <laughs> just, uh, we just played a bit more rent, so. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the one that sticks in my head is the is my mate when he was a ball boy and like there's when he got sort of his stall smashed to pieces and we just ended up like kind of standing there degraded for the rest of the game with all the way fans laughing at him. Yeah. That's quite a beautiful moment. Uh yeah. I can't I'll have to come back to you. <laughs> I'll send I you a voice now. I should <laughs> I should have put it at the top of the show, but it doesn't matter. Uh the Unimo podcast will be back. This week with a preview of the Man United game. Uh, I need to find a guest for that. I was trying to get Mark Goldbridge, actually. I remember. Um, which would be quite fun. So d- keep your eyes peeled for that. Just before we go, remember to subscribe to the YouTube and Spotify channels and also give us a follow on our socials. That's at the Eden Road on Twitter and at Eden Road Pod on Instagram. Steve, that was an absolute pleasure, mate. Do you want me to do the outro? Yeah, if you could do that, actually, that'd be great. <laughs> yes, yes, it's DJ Steve's. You're <laughs> locked on to the Eden Road podcast, yeah? Make sure you like listen to it and enjoy it and uh, learn all about Brentford because it's important. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Mate, that was class. That was literally so good. Sweet. Thank, Thank you, so you man. Down, man. Yeah. yeah. Cheers, really man. Appreciate that.